Hello, I'm Laura Simonoff, Dean of Temple University's College of Public Health, and joining me today are faculty experts Graciela Yasha, Sarah Bass, Chris Johnson, and Heather Murphy. Today, we're going to discuss vaccines. There are a lot of hopes that everyone's pinning on the development of a vaccine. However, most of us aren't really that familiar with the science of vaccines and the process of vaccine development. Um, as my mother said to me over the weekend, after she was listening to a story about one of the many vaccines being tested, she just said, I am so confused. So I hope what we can do is clarify what's going on with developing a vaccine for COVID-19. So um, I'd like to start with Graciela. So Graciela, what actually is a vaccine and how do you make a vaccine? Uh, well, Laura, let me first explain about the immune system so it's easier to understand vaccines. Uh, people become immune to a disease when they develop resistance to reinfection by that specific disease. So how do, you, uh, how do people become immune? Uh, it happens when the immune system produces very specific and effective antibodies that attack, destroy, and remember the harmful microorganism that previously caused disease. Usually people produce antibodies and become immune by either getting infected with a specific microorganism naturally or by receiving a vaccine prior to exposure to that specific microorganism. So a COVID-19 vaccine is a way to artificially fo force our immune system to become resistant to COVID-19. Typically, vaccines work uh, by introducing a weakened virus or killed or inactive virus or a piece of the virus in our bodies. And that induces immunity without causing disease. Uh, in recent approaches, a recent approach, um, vaccines are being developed to contain genetically engineered pieces of RNA or DNA. Uh, COVID um, the COVID-19 virus is an RNA virus, so pieces of RNA that instruct our cells to make copies of the protein that is found in the crown-like spikes on the, on the surface of the coronavirus. That's where the name comes from. And these protein copies that are induced uh, to, to be made by our bodies, uh, these protein copies induce an immune response that doesn't make us sick and protect, protect us from reinfection. So currently, all these approaches are being pursued by different laboratories around the world in search for an effective COVID-19 vaccine. Um, so, um, Chris, I guess that leads to the next question. So how are vaccines tested and we know, and how do we know they can work and that they're safe? Because I heard there's about 100 vaccines being developed. So, so can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so they're actually held to very high safety standards to balance that efficacy that you were talking about. Do they work? And the safety portion of it. So vaccines are first tested in the lab on tissue to see if they create that immune response that Graciela is talking about. And if they do that, then they move forward to animal testing. So they're tested on animals that are susceptible to that disease as well. And those animals not only are tested to see if they develop those antibodies, but also to see if they have any negative complications, like an allergic reaction or if it creates an unwanted side effect in the animals. So if it passes all those tests, then it moves to clinical testing, which consists of four different phases. So in phase one, there's a just a few people who are overwhelmingly healthy uh, that they're testing the vaccine on, again, to see if they develop antibodies and to make sure that there isn't, among healthy people, uh, a bad reaction. So you move forward from that to phase two, where there are people who are actually part of the um, kind of the target group. So our older people are more immunocompromised people to see if they have a different reaction than people who are healthy. Um, and in phase three, phase three is the one that follows that targeted group. And those are gonna be whenever we have thousands of people who are actually given the vaccine to see, once again, make sure that most people are developing an immune response and that 
there's a very, 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 very tiny percentage of people who might have an allergic reaction because we know that some people are sensitive to certain things that go into vaccines. So following that, it usually um, can pass the be certified by the Food and Drug Administration. And that's whenever we think things are healthy and they can be widely distributed. This is when your insurance company can start covering it. But we still monitor after that. That's what phase four is called. So even whenever something is widely implemented, everybody can have it. We're, the Food and Drug Administration is still monitoring that to make sure that it's healthy, it's still doing what it's supposed to do, and, it, and people aren't having negative reactions to it. And that whole process is why it can take a year or longer before we see a vaccine. About how long does it usually take to develop a vaccine? So the current record time for having created a vaccine was for the mumps, and it took four years, actually. Okay. So, Heather. So there's hundred, at least a hundred vaccines that are being developed out there. And Chris just said the, the record was four years. So um, I'd like you to talk about what are the possible vaccines currently under development. And then I think the crucial question for everybody is like, when might a safe and effective one be available? to us. Sure, Laura. Well, I, I looked up on the WHO website and as of May 22nd, there's actually 114 vaccines that are in preclinical phases. So that's what Chris was talking about in the lab or in animal studies. And that we're up to 10 vaccines that are in human phase one and phase two trials. So that's small groups of, of, of humans, of healthy people, and then some of those immunocompromised. And actually one of those trials is taking place at Dalhousie University um, where I went to do my schooling in Halifax, which is in Canada. Um, and that candidate vaccine is from a Chinese company called CanSino Biologics. And if successful, that one could proceed to phase two trials in hospitals and other provinces in Canada as early as the fall, and then be used in essential workers and high risk populations in late 2020 or early 2021. Now, there's at least two phase one trials going on in the US, one that's funded by the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, and they're recruiting in um, Georgia, Maryland, and Washington State. And another one's funded by Inevo Pharmaceuticals, and I couldn't find out where they're actually recruiting right now, but they are based in the US. There's one trial in Europe, one in the UK, one in Australia, and it looks like four others in China. So there's quite a few going around globally. And based off of some of the reports, it looks like there could be vaccines in phase two, phase three trials as early as late 2020 or early 2021. But mass production of the vaccine could take much longer. And kind of as Chris said, the mumps was a record, but typically vaccines can take on average 10 years to develop and produce on mass scale. And to put it in perspective, like the most recent vaccine that was developed rapidly was for Ebola, and that was done in five years. However, like on a more hopeful note, research for this vaccine has moved along at unprecedented pace because a lot of researchers are collaborating globally. And many really believe that a vaccine could be ready for emergency use in as early as 2021, which is really what would be promising for us to start to curb this epidemic and protect populations. So when you said emergency use, what do you mean by that? They're using it in primary, um, like uh, frontline workers, essential workers, and also potentially immunocompromised populations. So because we can't produce it at mass scale, it would be prioritized for the populations that are most at risk at first. I see. Okay. So of all the vaccines that you were looking at, um, were there any that you thought were the most promising? I think it's too hard to tell. Like they all are using different kind of technologies and mechanisms for delivery, um, which I think is is different than previous vaccines. So it'll be interesting to see if a certain um, delivery mechanism works better for this virus. And they've been trying some new technologies that haven't traditionally been used for vaccines before. So I think um, there, there might be a good candidate there and that might also allow rapid production of the vaccine. Mm -hmm. So this is sort of an interesting conundrum. On the one hand, I would say the majority of the population is kind of waiting anxiously for this virus, this vaccine to be available. But there's also 
a reasonably significant number of people in this country who are very afraid of vaccines and people who have said, I wouldn't take it if it were available. So Sarah, why are some people seemingly so afraid of vaccines and should we be afraid? So, uh, you know, what I would say is that there certainly are some people who don't want to get vaccinated or who are worried about being vaccinated. Um, Some of them make a lot of noise and the media covers them because they can be very provocative. Um, But they really don't represent the vast majority of Americans who do believe in vaccination. So there was a Gallup poll that was just from a couple months ago that showed that the um, majority of people, it was 85%, said that parents vaccinating their children just in general was extremely or very important. Um, And there was another survey in 2018 that showed that about half the people said that not having childhood vaccinations was the most concerning public health problem today. Um, so from a, you know, from a public health perspective, as, as Graciela was saying, vaccination is an important strategy for public health um, because it keeps us safe from disease. It's why we don't die of smallpox and we aren't paralyzed from polio. Um, so why do we hear about all of this? Uh, there are a few reasons. There's certainly a core of people who don't believe in vaccines, Um, whether that's because they think there are unfounded health effects that are being hidden by pharmaceutical companies or public health professionals, um, or they may just don't believe in medication at all. Um, That same Gallup poll also showed that about 80% of the respondents said that they'd heard a a great deal or a fair amount of um, information about the disadvantages of vaccines. So I think the, the question is, why is that? I think there's two two ways we can think about it. One is misinformation, which is just information that's just wrong and not based in fact. Um, but the other is more insidious, which is disinformation, uh, which is kind of deliberate misinformation to sow doubt. Um, and a lot of misinformation is driven actually by just a small group of people. So if you look at Facebook, for example, most anti-vaccination information comes from just seven groups on Facebook. Um, 54% of anti-vaccine Facebook ads are actually bought by just two groups. Um, And this is significant when Facebook has 2 billion users and 68% of those users of Americans say that they get their news from Facebook. Um, If we look at disinformation, most is done by foreign agents. who usually are only interested in sowing some kind of political or societal discord. So on Twitter, we see that the majority of vaccine tweets, both pro and con, are actually made by Russian trolls or bots. Um, And this is now spread to coronavirus, where uh, there was a brand new study that just came out uh, last week that has shown that almost half of all the accounts that are tweeting about COVID-19 are actually bots, um, probably from Russia and China. So, you know, while it's normal to question things that are new, I think it's also important to realize that the the majority of Americans do believe in vaccination and that the majority probably will get a coronavirus vaccine when it's available. Well, I know that makes me feel better. (laughs) Um, So anyway, I think that's it for today. Um, Thanks for joining us. Please remember that even as some areas of our country are rapidly opening up, we still need to stay six feet away from people we don't live with, wear a mask, keep washing your hands. Um, To hear last week's panel, view other videos, and find links to reliable information, please visit cph.temple.edu slash coronavirus. Thanks.